Hey everybody, I'm Pastor Larry Huggins here, live from Barcelona. Got started just a couple of minutes late, and I do apologize for that, but thank you for joining me today for a wonderful broadcast. I have some great things in store. Uh, I'm excited about sharing them with you. My purpose is to help you live your best life yet. So uh, if you're online, give me a little uh, a smiley face or something. Hello, let me see who's first online. Hello, Brian. Good to see you, man. Uh, I think about you often and bless you and just uh, I'm very, I'm very impressed by you and your beautiful wife becoming U.S. citizens. That's, that's quite an accomplishment. And what do you think about that? A European moves to the States and the States that got American moves to Europe. That's the way it works. Hello, Christine. Hello, others. All right. Let me, uh, let me get started. I'm a little harried here because I got off to a late start. But I want to pray for you. We will have communion because we are live today. Last week was pre-recorded. It's something we had to do. It was outside. It was noisy. And uh, so today everything is going swimmingly well, except for the fact uh, we started a couple of minutes late. And uh, let me get out my, uh, my electronic Bible here. Praise the Lord. Now let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for my friends and partners who are joining me today, and I hope we're making some new friends. I thank you for breathing on this broadcast and just let the Holy Spirit of wisdom and revelation be upon each and every one of those. Open our eye, every one of us, open our eyes that we can hear our, our, <laughs> can't believe what I just said. Open our eyes so that we can see, our ears so that we can hear, and our hearts so that we can understand what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. And help me to get my tongue off my eye tooth so I can see what I'm saying in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> I said, open our eyes so that we can hear. You probably caught that before I did. Well, listen, I want to talk to you about the winds of change. This is on my heart really big. And uh, it started last December when the Holy Spirit started uh, talking to me about changes coming this year. This year is a, a year of change. Uh, of course, every year brings changes, but I believe there will be some extraordinary changes for the body of Christ, some extraordinary changes in the world as we know it, and some changes for you. Now, here's what I want to say to you about that. Don't expect something bad. Expect something good. This is a good message. Change is a good thing. A lot of people are somewhat afraid of change and they go forward very carefully, you know, kind of going forward with their brakes on. Don't do that. Let go and let God lead you. As many are as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Think about the patriarch Abraham who left his home and his family in the Ur of the Chaldees and went out not knowing where he was going. He just knew that he would know it when he saw it. So he was looking for a city with foundations whose builder and maker is God. And if you trace his steps, well, he went a lot of different places before, uh, before the end of his life. And uh, that's not unusual for those who are following the Holy Spirit. I think about the Apostle Paul and all the different places that he went. And he said something that I took to heart a long time ago. And uh, I know you'll recognize this, and that's where we're going to start today, talking about the winds of change. Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14, Paul said, I count not myself to have apprehended, that means to take a hold of something. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. I preached a sermon once. It was serious, but it had a funny uh, kind of a hook on it. And uh, I would say, forget about it. <laughs> you know, forget about it. So forgetting the things that are behind, I press forward. Press means to, to really, uh, you know, proactively move forward. Not grudgingly, not passively, not reluctantly, not timidly, but really to, to move forward with uh, assertion, with a certain amount of aggression. And uh, that's, that's a mindset that I'll, I can say, truthfully, I have. This is my fourth international residence, Spain. I've uh, been in 70 nations of the world. I've been in every state in the United States. I cannot tell you how many cities I've been in because part of my ministry is to go forth. You know, Jesus said, go ye into the whole world. And so I've got some go ye in me, and it's just second nature for me to go. 
It's not difficult for me to go. I kind of like uh, seeing things. My first words, this is the honest truth. When I was a youngster, my first words were not mama or daddy. My first word was outside. <laughs> I was ready to go. I came into this world ready to go. And I still got go ye in me. I have things to do, people to meet, and uh, an assignment on my life, and it involves going. Now, not everyone is going to to have the radical lifestyle that I have and my wife Loretta has, but uh, you need to get ready for change because change is inevitable. It's coming your way, like it or not. The, the future is coming at you rapidly, and you may as well be ready for it. Now, if you're prepared, then it won't be such a shock to your system. If you're not prepared, well, it may, things may catch you by surprise. But let me tell you this, there will be climate changes. There will be political changes. There will be socioeconomic changes. In the church, we're going to see changes. Doctrinal changes, the change of guard, new leadership coming up, old leadership fading away. Uh, that's a way of life, so prepare for change. Some of you you're going to have some changes in your local church and your leadership there. Well, don't get nervous about it. It's like being in a boat. You know, you'll hit some choppy water, but just let the boat do what boats do. They float. They keep going. Don't get excited about every little bump. I watch people on the airplane, and every time there's a little bump in the air, a little rough air, they grab a hold of the seat, and they, they get nervous as if they're going to hold themselves up and hold the airplane up by holding on to the seat. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. But I know people try to get a grip on things because it, this bump makes them nervous. Well, I lived in South America where earthquakes are something that happened all the time. Almost every day we had tremors. And of course, you from California, I lived in California for many, many years. That's where I met my beautiful wife, Loretta. She's from San Francisco. And uh, they're pretty used to the ground moving underneath of them. I'll tell you a funny story. We were in Washington, D.C. when that earthquake hit Washington, D.C. And let me tell you something. People were coming out of the building and running around, and it took a long time for them to calm down because they had never been in an earthquake. And to them, it seemed like the end of the world. And, and Sister Loretta and I are just calm, and we're going about our business. We're not disturbed in the least. And people said, you must be from California. We said, yeah, we're from California. On the other hand, uh, my wife wasn't used to hurricanes, and her first hurricane made her a little, gave her pause, I'll put it that way. She wasn't scared, but, uh, it, you know, she, she had never been through a hurricane, and so she was wondering what to do. Well, I've been through hurricanes. Let me tell you, here's what I'm saying. These little bumps and ripples and changes will pass, but you and I will abide forever because we're in Christ, and we're built upon the rock that cannot be shaken. Storm winds will blow and dark clouds will rise, but God put a rainbow in the sky and you and I have nothing to be afraid of. So operate in faith and embrace the future. This is a year of change. The winds are blowing in your direction, so hoist your sails and catch the wind. You are going to be living your best life yet, every day better than the day before. I'm going to be uh, serious with you here for a moment, but my job description is to help you live your best life. That's what Sister Loretta and I do. And I started thinking about uh, us being here in Spain. We have so many friends and our social calendar is full. I mean to tell you, people call us every day to invite us to do things with them. And uh, my wife and I were remarking about the, the favor we have upon our lives here in Spain. And I, I figured it out. Uh, we, we bring joy with us. We bring happiness with us. We bring a zest for life with us. And people like that. They need it. And they know that wherever we go, uh, that the atmosphere is going to change and people are going to perk up and we're going to laugh and have fun and and uh, people have told us over and over, we feel like we've known you all of our lives, your family to us, you know, and we appreciate those accolades. But what they're sensing is our inner man, Christ in us, the hope of glory. They're sensing that. And when we walk in the room, joy walks in the room. When we walk in the room, peace walks in the room. When we walk in the room, love and hope walk in the room. And I want that for you. I, I want you to have 
a freedom about living and a joy and a favorable expectation of the future. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to help you forget about the past and reach into your future. Now, your future is where you're going to live the largest part of your life. If you consider the time that you've spent upon the earth compared with eternity, well, there's really no comparison. This time on the earth is infinitesimally brief. Is that a word, infinitesimal? You know what I'm talking about. It's real short. <laughs> so so uh, it's infinitely short. Your time on earth compared to the timeline of eternity to which just stretches on forever and ever. Well, our, our sojourn here on earth is very brief. So what is ahead? It's called the future. And where is the future? Is it Does it begin 10 years from now or five years from now? No, when you sat down to watch this broadcast, you started moving into your future. And with every word, you're hearing a word that's come out of your future because I'm saying it before you're hearing it. So I'm already in your future, maybe a nanosecond. Uh, uh, maybe there's a couple of seconds leniency between what I say and what you hear due to the limitations of wireless technology. Aren't you impressed by my grasp of technology? I am. I'm going to take a moment. Uh, but latency is, is that little lag between when I say it and when you hear it. So you, really, you're hearing a message from your future. I'm in your future. <laughs> and I'm telling you, it's good here. I can't wait for you to catch up to your future because God has great things in store for you. Your future is just as pure and unpolluted and unspoiled as the Garden of Eden on day seven of creation. There's no disease in your future. There's no hardship in your future. There's no sickness in your future. There's no disappointment in your future. There's, there's no regret in your future. You say, well, well, how does stuff get in my life? We don't let go. We don't let go of the past. Paul said, forgetting the past. In other words, letting go of the past. It's very difficult for people to let go. They keep dragging their past forward and all of their regrets. I talk to people all the time and I don't do much counseling anymore. I'm counseling right now. But as far as the the one-on-one, -on -one, I do some bereavement counseling and I talk to preachers because preachers have, you know, special challenges sometimes and it's more of a consultation, like a professional consultation where they need insight and some wisdom. But as far as uh, drilling down into the nitty gritty of what makes people tick and why they are the way they are, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist, and I'm not a licensed counselor. So I don't do much counseling except by the Word of God and by the Spirit of God, which I find much more effective than doing the psychodrama stuff. But I have had a little experience counseling with people back in the old days. And almost to the last person, everyone wanted to tell me about their past. They wanted to tell me about their childhood. They wanted to tell me about their regrets and disappointed, you know, and, and uh, the way they were raised and the problems they had with their daddy, daddy issues or lack of having a daddy or mama issues or not treated fairly or being the runt of the litter and and people will say, you know, my, my first husband treated me so badly. I'm not insensitive, but, you know, the next question is, well, what's going on right now with your ex-husband? Oh, he passed away years ago, but he treated me so badly. <laughs> well, if he passed away years ago, he's not thinking about you. So why are you thinking about him? Is that too much like simple? <laughs> Come on. Now then, uh, let's see where we are in time. I'm having so much fun. I let the time get away from me. Um, Hebrews 12.1, lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run the race with patience or perseverance without quitting that is set before us. Now, let me tell you something. This is actually, a, I think in my mind, closer to a football match than it is, you know, like a sprint or a relay race because it says the, uh, the race that is before us. And lay aside every sin. Uh, sin is missing the mark, you know, not achieving your goals. Our goal is to hit the bullseye in God, but sometimes we 
things happen that we don't really hit the bullseye. So what do we do? We correct and we take aim again and we go forward. We don't just stop and say, oh my God, I missed the bullseye. I quit. People do that, but you don't do that. You just keep trying. You keep going forward. You mend and adjust. You mend and adjust. You don't quit because sinning is is something that you need to mend and adjust. It's missing the mark. So Paul said, Let's lay aside every weight and the sin. Notice the definite article there, the sin which does so easily beset us. That word beset is interesting. It's a competitive word. And it means uh, at every turn, someone or something is getting in our way, trying to get us off course, trying to stop us, trying to hold us back trying to block us, like football, you know. Uh, the, the quarterback gets the ball, well, instantly uh, people are trying to take him down. And uh, maybe the, the guards are trying to take him down, or the center is trying to take him down, but he gets through. Now the linebackers are trying to take him down. And as he run, he's running downhill with the ball towards the goalpost, everybody's trying to get in his way and knock him down. So he's he's dodging and, and uh, faking and trying to get to the finish line because at every turn, something's trying to block him. Now, that's the sin that so, does so easily block us, the sin. I could ask the question, what is your sin? And when you ask people that, they automatically go to say, well, you know, I'm a glutton or I'm a wine bibber. You know, I've got a spirit of lust or, you know, I'm rebellious or I'm a liar. Or, I'm a thief. You know, they think about the Ten Commandments and all of that. Uh, but uh, I, I want you to pull that back in and think about those things that knock us off course. And what's the number one sin that does beset you? Uh, I'll tell you what, it, what I think it is. And I, I believe I'm right. When you go to heaven, you can ask Jesus and he'll tell you. Ambassador Huggins was right about this. Uh, it's fear. In one form or another, fear is always trying to hold us back. You know, because we had trauma in the past, it produces a, a fear. You know, it's a conditioned response. Well, you know, I was, I was uh, sitting uh, facing north drinking iced tea when lightning struck our house, you know, fried my hair. And so I'm not going to sit outside facing north and drink iced tea ever again. Because, you know, we make those associations because of something. I was being ridiculous there, forgive me. We make those associations, and that's out of fear. And it's an avoidance thing. The reason people don't go forward is they're trying to avoid confrontation. They're trying to avoid disappointment. They're trying to avoid rejection. Let me, let me get into this a little further, drill down into it. The opposite of, of faith is fear. And Paul said, what is not of faith is sin. So unbelief is sin. Doubt is sin. Worry is sin. Insecurity is sin. All of those are sin. Anything that comes from unbelief, what is not a faith, is sin. And we have to be motivated by faith and not by fear. Do you, are you afraid of the future? Are you afraid of tomorrow? Are you afraid of growing old? Uh, what? We don't even admit these things to ourselves. Sometimes we don't want to admit that the reason we don't make, meet new people, that we're not friendly, is we want to avoid relationships where we might be disappointed. Well, you know, my friend stabbed me in the back. Well, they persecuted Jesus and they'll persecute you. But we need to get over it. There's 7.5 billion people on the earth and they're not all mean and wicked and out to get you. And if you'll be friendly, you'll have friends. If you're a loyal friend, you'll attract loyal friendships. That's the way that works. So don't, don't be afraid and stay at home and be a little shrinking violet, you know. Nobody loves me. And, you know, you, you're around people. You don't want to talk. You're afraid to open your mouth. Afraid you'll say something wrong. Afraid that someone won't like you. Afraid that they'll reject you. It's fear. And you got to get rid of it because what is not of faith is sin, and that's one of the things that you got to lay aside. Those sins that do, do so easily beset you or stand in your way. So, uh, 
What is not of faith is sin. So doubt is, is sin, right? Because doubt is unbelief. It's the opposite of believing. It's the opposite of faith. So we got to get rid of doubt. Doubt is a sin. You have to move forward in faith. Praise the Lord. The winds of change are blowing. You got to have confidence. You got to believe the word of God. And now, now this is an interesting thing about doubt. Mark eleven twenty three. 23, everybody knows that. If you've ever listened to a sermon by Kenneth E. Hagin, you know Mark eleven twenty three. 23. And he said, uh, if you believe and not doubt in your heart, not doubt in your heart, and not doubt in your heart. This is an interesting phrase because in the Greek language, it actually means shall not receive doubt. Doubt comes from without. It's not produced in the heart of a born again believer. God has given each and every one of us the measure of faith. It's normal for us to believe God, to trust God. It's not normal to doubt. Doubting is not normal for a believer. See what I mean? We call ourselves believers because that's what we are by nature, our new nature. We're in Christ. He doesn't doubt. Why should we doubt? Does he have confidence in, in the promises of God? Yes. So if we're in Christ, why should we have doubt? We're born again of an incorruptible seed. God made your spirit man perfect. You're complete in Christ. He didn't put doubt into you. So where's the doubt coming from? It's not the product of a born again spirit. Doubt comes from without. Comes through your ears, comes through your eyes. You know, it's like the believers were fishermen and they're in the boat and it's sinking. <laughs> they saw the storm, they saw the waves, they saw the boat filling up with water and doubt got a hold of them. And Jesus got up and rebuked the storm and he said, oh, ye of little faith. That word little means brief or short-term faith. A lot of people have a little short burst of faith and then very soon and doubt takes over, doubt comes in. So this part, I hope you're listening to. If you don't hear anything else I've said, prepare yourself for what I'm about to say. I'm coming out of your future with a word that you need to hear. And, and this is super cool. Believing actually means not contending. You know what contending is or arguing or pushing back or struggling. Believing is not a struggle. It's the easiest thing you'll ever do. Doubt is hard work. Doubt is contending. Doubt is a struggle. Doubt is arguing with God and His Word. Now let me tell you, you're never going to win if you argue with God and His Word. If He says you're righteous, then you're righteous. If He says you're saved, then you're saved. Whatever His Word says, that is the truth, and you can't argue with the truth and doubting is arguing with the veracity or against the veracity of God's word, God's truth. Doubt is taking the wrong position and you'll never win. Doubt is a losing proposition. You'll always come up against God when you're doubting and he's not going to move one iota off of his word. He's not going to say, well, you're right. I'm really not for healing. I sent Jesus to bear your stripes, but I didn't really mean it. Of course not. It's already settled in heaven, so uh, we need to settle it in our minds. Doubt comes from without. So if we cast out the doubt, what's the, what's the condition of our heart? Faith. Faith is there. It's always there. It's doubt that's trying to block your faith. All you have to do is cast out the doubt. Let go of the doubt. Say goodbye to the doubt and you will have faith because you were created by God to have faith. <laughs> Maybe that's too simple for some people to grasp. So doubting is harder than believing. Amen. You cast out the doubt, faith will remain. Will remain. Well, I think that's really enough for today. Jesus is our burden bearer. Let's cast all of our care over on Him. Honey, tomorrow's a new day and the mercies of God are new every morning. So let's not take any regrets into tomorrow. In fact, let's have communion today, this morning, wherever you are, what time it is. And after we have communion, you can let go of all that stuff. And after this forward, 
you can expect good things to happen because you let go of unforgiveness, you've let go of regret, you've let go of shame, you've let go of pain, you've let go of disappointment, and most importantly, you've let go of fear, unbelief, doubt, the sin that doth so easily beset all of us. Praise the Lord. Good stuff, huh? I hope you go back and listen. This is one you'll have to listen again, and I'll tell you why. Because the more people listen to faith teaching, the more complicated it seems to become. You know, seven steps, five steps, you got to do this, you got to do that. No, all you got to do is kick out the doubt. That's all you have to do is kick out the doubt. Come on, let me hear you shout. Kick out the doubt. <laughs> I can get real preachy on you. Listen, I'm going to move forward so my head's going to get twice the size of the screen and pick up my communion cup because we're going to have communion. There we go. Praise God. Yep, uh, communion, live online communion. That's one of the reasons I really love the internet uh, live streaming is because we can join one another in the Lord's table and share the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going to talk here for a minute. You go get your elements if you don't already have them later. And let me tell you, those who are new to this broadcast, um, with very few exceptions, we always have communion. Last week we didn't, which was the first time in, gosh, over a year and it, that we didn't have communion, and I felt kind of funny about it. In fact, I felt real funny about it. We may have done that twice this year, and, and I'd rather have communion, not because I'm religious, but because I believe Jesus, it's important, Jesus said, as often as you do this. And we've got to take care of, do some maintenance and take care of spiritual business. And every day we have to forgive. Every day we have to forget. Every day we have to overcome something. And, and communion is one of the best ways to get this, these problems under the blood and move on with our lives. Yeah, somebody did you wrong. Well, have communion and forgive and forget about it. Praise the Lord. You don't need to drag all that stuff. Cast your care over on Jesus. He's your burden bearer. And one of the ways to cast it over is through communion. There's an old fable about an elderly man who's walking down a dusty road carrying a huge load of wood. He's a wood chopper and he's going to market in the village. Along comes, comes a kind neighbor in a cart driven by a horse and he said, come on neighbor, get in and I'll take you to town. So the old man gets in and he stands in the back of the cart with this big pile of wood on his shoulders and his uh, friend says, uh, old man, put the wood down. You're in my cart now. And the old man said, no, this is my burden. I'll carry it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Honey, get into Jesus' cart and let all your weight down on him. Unburden yourself. Jesus is the burden bearer. There's no need for you to carry this burden. Let me tell you something. If you hang on to yesterday's burden, and the burden from the day before, and the burden from the day before, and the burden from your early marriage, and the burden from your teenage years, and the burden from your adolescence. It's a burden you can't bear. So let go of it. Forget the past. Press forward to the future. Now we're going to have communion, and uh, then I have a very, very important thing to share with you. I've got a good testimony to share with you. And so let's have communion. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus bore our sins for us so that we don't have to bear them. And he paid the price so that we don't have to have any fear of punishment. And he took away uh, the enemy's right to hold anything against us or over us. Certainly we miss the mark, but thank God we have the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the body of the Lord, which was broken for us so that we can be healed. I have friends watching me and they need to get healed. They need to get over their childhood. They need to get over their, their earlier life. They need to get over what happened this morning <laughs> or last night. And this is a good way to do it. You were broken so that we could be whole. Let's eat together. Jesus said, this is the cup, this, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. As often as you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood, which washes away our sin. Thank you for your blood. There's life in your blood. Thank you that your blood is in heaven right now, speaking better things over us than, Cain, than Abel's blood. 
And when we drink this, it's going to seal us. It's going to wash us. It's going to purify us. And it's going to prepare us for our future. In the name of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, what's my good testimony? Uh, this is kind of neat. I think you'll like it. I, I had a thought the other day. I'm, I'm, you know I'm, me, I'm positive. I'm always, always pretty much up, have very few uh, pity parties. But I, I was tempted to have a pity party recently. And I was thinking, gee whiz, uh, since we've been in Spain, a lot of my friends have forgotten about me. What's the deal? Now I'll tell you, that, that thought didn't last very long. I cast it out. But I, I admit, I did have that thought. I thought, why, why have people forgotten about me? I know I've blessed, I know I've blessed tens and tens of thousands of people uh, in my life. Where are they now? It's like Jesus healed the ten lepers and, one, lepers and one came back to give him glory. So thank God for the ones who do appreciate me. But, you know, we're human, so we think those thoughts sometimes. So I get a message from some friends of mine in Canada, and they've given me permission to use their name. Pastor Al and Patty Huggett. That's easy to remember because it sounds like Huggins. And they live up in Sarnia, Ontario, British Columbia. They've been friends for many, many years. In their, in their church, we've had some great miracles. We've had cancers healed and, and uh, skeletal problems healed and you name it. There have been a lot of miracles. And um, one of the reasons is, you know, receive a prophet because he is a prophet. You get the prophet's reward. So they have received me as their prophet, prophet and celebrated me and I tell you, they get, they get a lot, a lot of miracles in that church when I come there. And so they got a hold of me out of the blue and they said, uh, Brother Huggins, you've been in the full-time ministry 45 years and your anniversary for ministry is coming up soon. It'll be 46 years. And we are going to give you $10 a year for every year you've been in ministry. We're going to send you a check for $450. And then we are pledging personally, not from the church, but from us, a hundred dollars a month to your ministry. And uh, that, I, I have to tell you, thank God for the money, but it meant so much more to me. It really, it really was a blessing that someone would think about me and think about Loretta and recognize the 45 plus years that I have invested in other people's lives around the world. And many times, uh, thankless. I know that God is not unthank, un, un, unthankful to forget my labor of love. Uh, he remembers. But sometimes people, you know, they, they kind of forget. And uh, I'm so happy that people remember that I've been sowing into other people's lives for 45 years. Uh, more than half of my life has been dedicated to other people in the ministry. And so uh, it was great to do that. You know, $10 doesn't sound like a lot of money, but uh, it, is, it all counts. It's all sweet. And it, it has so much personal meaning for me. I'm celebrating it. Of course, somebody out there could probably give me $1,000 a year, and uh, that'd be okay. I'd do the math on that. It'd be $450,000. I wouldn't have, to, we wouldn't have to uh, uh, be concerned about paying the bills around here ever. So uh, anyway, thank God with me for those people who have celebrated my ministry by giving me a gift for every year I've been in ministry. And then, of course, the $100 a month. We love our partners. We pray for our partners twice a day. I'm not kidding you. And he who receives a prophet, because he is a prophet, gets the prophet's reward. And uh, my wife can tell you we are always uh, speaking and praying and confessing the prophet's reward over everyone who contributes to our ministry, who invests in our ministry. And uh, if you enjoy our ministry, if you're feeding and enjoying our ministry, if you're listening to these broadcasts, well, uh, it would be the right thing to do for you to sow into this ministry. We've sown spiritual things, we have a right, the Bible says, to reap carnal things. It's just the way the Bible works. Amen? Give double honor to those who labor in the Word. So 
do the Bible and, uh, you know, whomever is blessing you, bless them back. We don't want your tithe that belongs to the local church. Now, if you don't have a pastor and you don't have a church, you're in between churches, people find themselves in that situation sometimes. Well, yes, we'll receive your tithe temporarily until you get a church and then we want to see you put those tithes in that church. However, you can always give us an offering, something over and above your tithe. And there is a blessing in that. The offering is the multiplier. I'll, I'll teach about that one day. It's a powerful truth. So I hope you had a good time with this broadcast. And do me a favor, share and tell other people about it. Get on Twitter and your different social media outlets, Facebook, and share and tell other people about the broadcast because you'll want them to be blessed too. I'm here to help you live your best life. In Jesus' name, have a great day.